Hello, my name is Marcus. I'm the compiler of a collection of therapy quotes entitled Psychoanalytic Self-Awareness Quotes. This is TQ 410 to 413. Therapy quote number 410. Unconscious wishes do not enter the symptom in direct form. Only the defense against the unconscious wish is visible in the symptom. Anxiety pertains to the defense. So let's say the person um, is an emotional eater. If his favorite comfort food is not there, he might feel a little anxiety. So you think the anxiety is related to not getting his favorite or not having his favorite comfort food. Um, but so that's not, so that's indirect. Uh, the direct cause of the anxiety, the underlying it, was the person's unmet need for sweetness. Right. So, so we start off with the unconscious wish, which was, so we're talking about a developmental trauma. The person didn't get enough of his mother's love. So, when there's a trauma, there's the repetition compulsion goes awry. He's going to keep on chasing it uh, in symbolic form. The attempt, the positive intention is to master the trauma, but it goes awry because, because you can never go in a time machine, travel back in time to get mother's love. You can't change the, you can't change the past. But the person is symbolically repeating it in the repetition compulsion in an attempt to master the trauma. But after the age of five, it goes awry. So the person projects sweet mother or sweet love onto the cookie. He chases the cookie. If the cookie's not available, he feels anxious. Do you see? So you, the, the anxiety is related to the missing cookie. That's indirect. Um, the original source is the anxiety from the repetition compulsion gone awry of not receiving mother's affection and love. So there's just this the idea that it's not direct. So you, the, the symptom is... Um, the person might not be aware of it. So the person is an emotional eater. He's emotionally eating and he doesn't know why. Right? And then he feels anxiety. He thinks it's related to the to the defense, of the, to the emotional eating. So there's that, so there's like this layered aspect to it. First you have the wish, the unconscious wish that gets denied or a person's not aware of it because they're blinded by the repetition compulsion gone awry chasing symbols so not aware of it all they're aware of is the anxiety related to this to the defense mechanism of emotional eating one author says when you do feel some anxiety uh, that's an opportunity to look at the original unconscious wish it's, it's an it's a clue to the unconscious wish he says in the emotional eater it's missing, not receiving enough of mother's comfort. Um, with the person with the narcissistic pattern, that's more about not being seen. It's more of an existential thing. He wasn't mirrored at all. So in the narcissistic pattern, the defense mechanism of the person with this pattern is to identify with the grandiose part self of himself. So he always wants to be mirrored. As one self-help author puts it, the the object of my affection is my reflection. So he's looking for mirroring because he wants to be seen. Um, now, if, he, if he's not seen, if he's not number one in the setting he's in, uh, if people are not talking to him or he doesn't feel important or if he doesn't feel he's one-up everybody somehow, he may feel the anxiety of not, being, of not being number one in the room or something like that. Um, but that's indirect. The original source of that was that the narcissistic p pattern is there to hide uh, the unmet need for mirroring. So a person with a narcissistic pattern might become envious of others who are ignoring him or who seem happier than him. Um, that's, the, that's his anxiety, the envy. Okay. Uh, and he thinks it's just related to his not getting his narcissistic needs met. That's all he's aware of. What he's missing is that the defense itself of narcissism is there to deal with the hungry and rich empty part self of not being seen. You see, something like that.
it's just that I so just this idea of it being layered like an onion you know you peel the layers of the onion and then you cry right <laughs> okay uh, let's move on to 411 the disturbance in the intimate physical experiences of the early months led to the formation of a threatening image of the mother Thus, identification processes were used more for defense, i.e., the child imitated the mother in total and in this way perfected a controllable kinesthetic image of the mother to replace the threatening representation of the mother. So this is one way of talking about identification with the aggressor. This is common in the narcissistic pattern. They identify with the aggressor. They, they think and act like their mothers to control the mother rather than be frightened by her they identify with her and they feel that they're managing it somehow so that's so the theory here is that um okay the disturbance in the intimate physical experiences in the early months led so what that means is um you know it's heartbreaking to see this but some mothers don't handle their babies with care and tenderness they they treat them like a sack of potatoes or something when they wash them, it's rough and aggressive, or uh, when they, they don't support their necks, or they when they put them down and the baby's head flops or something, or they're just, it's unbelievable that mothers can be so uh, indifferent to how the baby might be feeling, to the way she's handling the baby. It's kind of like in yesterday's video when the baby was in the womb kicking and frightened and the cord was twisted around his leg and he was having a hard time breathing and and the mother thought, hey, come, look, let's celebrate the baby's kicking. And they were all happy, thinking that she's disconnected from the reality of the baby's suffering. So it's sort of a similar thing. The mother's not realizing that if she handles the baby after birth in such a rough manner, that's going to hurt the baby. I don't understand how mothers cannot see that. It's, it's so... Anyway, some mothers, it seems handle the baby in a rough manner um, so the baby as a result is going to have image of the mother as being a threatening there's going to be a threatening image in the baby's mind of the mother now remember the baby's tiny and helpless and highly dependent and from the baby's point of view the mother is like a giant from the baby's point of view when you think about the size difference how many times bigger is the mother to the baby see you, someone can do the math so it's, it's like Godzilla up there you know it's a massive from the baby's point of view now this giant is being rough and aggressive to the baby so the baby's image is, is of the, the mother is very terrifying in his psyche so what does he do he can't face that one there's the there's the defense mechanism of identification with the aggressor the psychic image of himself identifies with the psychic image of the other so now he's incorporated this image of her into himself and he's trying to manage it to contain it to hold it to not be so terrorized by it so he's identified with it that's the theory of identification with the aggressor that's the narcissistic pattern they've identified with their mothers they think and act like their mothers right the mama's boy and all that right anyways um so it, it, it's he's saying the child needed to identify with the mother so the child imitated the mother in completely. In this way, the child perfected a way, uh, he perfected a controllable, kinesthetic, body felt image of the mother. He just becomes her. So he doesn't feel her. If he is her, he does not feeling her because it's his identity now. He does this to replace the image to see, he doesn't want to see it, so he becomes it. It's a weird, it's an awful, it's a sad phenomena uh, if the mother's abusive and then the child just becomes like the mother. Oh, hold on a sec. On this heavy topic, I've got a little levity here. The blue bird of happiness is paying us a brief visit. He's going to jump and fly off. There he goes. Okay. <laughs> so there's the Blue bird of happiness. We haven't seen him in a while. It's nice to see him again. Okay. <laughs> and there he goes. 
I love how he does his little hops, you know. <laughs> so, you know, the, um, so the baby wasn't feeling happy if the mother is being so frightening. So how does he deal with that? Um, he identifies with her. Yeah, that's a tough topic, you know. Um, remember, the narcissistic pattern is based on unresolved infantile the un the unresolved infantile megalomania of the baby. Okay, remember that's magical thinking is there. He thinks he causes everything, so that's still there. Plus, he identifies with the omnipotence of the giant representation of the other. So now he's he thinks he's so important, and so that's what's happened. That's why the person with a narcissistic pattern can be uh, kind of demanding and has strong expectations that others mirror him and think he, you know, that's so he's puts on a convincing act actually. Um, a lot of uh, people who. Uh, marry a person with a narcissistic pattern, it, it sometimes takes them decades to realize what, what's going on. And then they write a self-help book on codependency, <laughs> something like that. Okay, let's uh, move on. Another heavy topic, my apologies, 412. Because of our premature birth, humans are not only physically but even more so psychologically ill-prepared to face postnatal life. Only a continuous bonding to the mother or an adequate substitute and the development of a relationship of marked dependence on her, accompanied by all the appropriate emotions, can compensate for, for our immaturity as newborns. I just had that there as a follow-up to yesterday's video, so I won't elaborate on it. Yesterday had some material and the day before on uh, prenatal trauma. I won't get into it now, but he's saying again, humans come out of the womb too early. No one really knows why. Uh, there's one theory that, that seems to be floating around, which is that... Um, when humans uh, became upright and started running, uh, the pelvis adapted to that, and that made it, uh, and so there wasn't enough space to hold the baby to full term, so the baby has to come out early because there's not enough space there. It's one theory. I don't know. I didn't look into it. But whatever it is, whatever caused it, humans come out of the womb too early, too helpless, too dependent. So an extended womb is created from birth to six months called the stage of symbiosis. That's the symbiotic stage, stage of undifferentiation. The baby doesn't know where he ends and his mother begins, just like in the womb, sort of an extension of the womb. It's meant to be safe, just like the womb. It's meant to be warm and safe, just like the womb. And, that, and then at six months, the child differentiates. He gets the idea that he's separate from his mother. That's the, that's the foundation for future ontological security. Then he goes, then he plays with his toys and he explores. The mother supports it. Uh, he, he has a chance to get to know himself. Then at the age of three, he internalized all those loving, all that support, and he achieves ontological security. And his psychic umbilical cord is uh, to himself. He can connect to himself and his access to the real self. That's the key to the real self. And, and with that, the capacities of the real self. So that's called a psychological birth. But the main idea here is that, again, babies come out too early and we need, he need, he's ill-prepared to face postnatal life. He's not ready to face life. So the mother's there to offer an extended womb for the first six months and then to support the separation individuation process until he reaches the psychological birth. Okay, so we'll just end on a lighter note here. In general, the bottom line is, okay, 
Know yourself. Find the truth. Express the truth. So that maybe sort of summarizes the whole thing. First we know ourselves. Know thyself. But remember the self is the body-mind totality of the conscious, pre-conscious, and the unconscious in the body, in the body-mind. So we have to know the unconscious. Right? Then when you... Then you then you find the truth, that means you find the real self and the capacities of the real self. Once you find the capacities of the real self, then you can express your truth. You can set goals in the real self. Now I'm adapting this quote. The original context of this quote was from the, the mental hygiene movement from the 1950s, where they were advising young people about the importance of honesty. And they, and they were saying that... Uh, uh, it's common sense uh, that uh, he says, know yourself, uh, know what you're feeling, know what your motivations are, find the truth, don't jump to conclusions, you know, uh, get the facts, like, um, and then express the truth uh, cleanly, like in a way that others will understand and uh, to the best of your ability. He was just talking about communication skills and the importance of honest communication. I'll just play that little clip from the movie. It isn't always easy to be honest. But when you have a problem involving your own honesty, it'll help you to remember these three pointers. Know yourself. Be sure of your intentions, the motives behind what you're doing and saying. Find the truth. Test it in the light of past experience and by checking in every way you can. And express the truth. Make sure you say what you mean to say. And make sure your meaning is clear to your listeners. Oh, hold on. We've got the Blue Jay back. There's the truth. Hello, Blue Jay. So, oh, there he goes. Oh, we haven't seen the blue bird of happiness in such a long time, so it's nice to see him again. Uh, maybe we'll just play that clip again, just to make sure we got it. Hold, hold on a sec here. Let's see if I can find it. So he's, he was talking to some teenagers, and um, the story was uh, uh, there was a misunderstanding. The guy saw something, he jumped to a conclusion. Uh, his girlfriend used that for her little scheme, and things got, and the poor, <laughs> and the, the victim was sort of, <laughs> the hapless guy uh, was... Uh, Okay, here we go. I don't know why that's so. It isn't always easy to be honest. But when you have a problem involving your own honesty, it'll help you to remember these three pointers. Know yourself. Be sure of your intentions. The motives behind what you're doing and saying. Find the truth. Test it in the light of past experience and by checking in every way you can. And express the truth. Make sure you say what you mean to say. And make sure your meaning is clear to your listeners. Okay. Now, Bob. Okay. <laughs> now, Bob. <laughs> so, Bob, in the end, uh, he was sort of the victim in this. He explained he did something really kind of minor, but it got misunderstood, misread, blown out of proportion. And then the woman used that as an opportunity to exaggerate it, to paint a picture about him, to demonize him, because that met her secret plan to support her boyfriend to so that her boyfriend would replace poor Bob Ray <laughs> on the team and all that. Anyways, the mental hygiene movement from the 50s, they have a few good clips, uh, videos there. 
I posted, uh, uh, I listed about 20 of them in a previous video. So this is one of them. It's called uh, How Honest Are You from 1950 from the Mental Hygiene Movement. Um, so anyways, so the original context of the of this quote is, is that telling people to uh, not jump to conclusions. Well, first to know your motivations, to understand why you might be saying something like Okay, and then uh, so be honest with yourself, and then exp make an I statement. So I so I'm adapting. I'm just borrowing that in general uh, for the psychological birth. Know thyself, the totality of the self. Know about our defense mechanisms. Uh, know about um, if there's a defense mechanism. What's the unconscious wish around it? Uh, does that come from a developmental trauma? Is there repetition compulsion gone awry? What is the repetition compulsion? What is the broken record that we're repeating? Remember Berger's metaphor, everyone carries a long playing vinyl record, uh, music disc record, and every time they see a record player, they play that record, so they bring the past into the present and they're replaying it. That's the repetition compulsion gone awry. Uh, and it's endless because you're no one can time travel back to change what happened you know so that leads to when we face the developmental trauma we realize that there's a deep ambivalence within of love and hate for the mother but we're unaware of it so when we talk about it it starts to come up so when you find the truth okay so find the truth um, you're facing that ambivalence right and then you're, you're gonna realize that the mother was caught in her existential dilemma and the father as well they were caught in their existential dilemmas the parent both parents so the parent may have had prenatal trauma birth trauma right see back then in the hospital procedures were more uh, uh, maybe uh, more mechanized mechanized or something so there could have been more birth trauma back then uh, they may have had intergenerational trauma situational trauma um, you know trauma with family members siblings and school shock and trauma with at the dentist's office trauma while getting one's tonsils out so the parents may have been caught in their existential dilemma so we in the process of uh, finding the truth uh, we realize the ex our truth, the experience of our truth, and the ambivalence is there. That brings up the memories, and we slowly work through. Uh, see, the knowledge makes us feel safe, so then we can start some of the, uh, the tension from the inner conflict is eased. So there's, the tears can come from that, because you feel safe. Uh, so you're working through the mourning process. It's, it's a whole process. Uh, to, to, to heal ourselves. So when we say know yourself, we, let's say know all about what happened and in the process of working, doing that, we're ultimately going to find a psychological birth. So we're going to find uh, our real self and the capacities of the real self. And then we can express the truth of our real selves. So I'm just borrowing this phrase uh, for this series, if that's okay. Um, they were talking about just practical communication skills in the movie. Uh, I recommend it, yeah. A short film, 1950, How Honest Are You? Um, I'm just borrowing it for the psychological birth process, right? The hero's journey. <laughs> Anyways, that's a good little quote. Know yourself. So either way, either in the context of the film or in the context of what we're trying to do here, Know yourself, find the truth, and express the truth. Okay, I'll just do a quick uh, zip through here. Unconscious wishes do not enter the symptom in direct form. Only the defense against the unconscious wish is visible in the symptom. Anxiety pertains to the defense. The disturbance in the intimate physical experiences in the early months, led to the formation of a threatening image of the mother. 
Now, you know, burglar has a theory about that, about the way the mother's handling the baby. He, he calls it uh, uh, a collection of baby's fears. And he has a small list of the fears that the baby has. If, if the mother does the feeding incorrectly, uh, the, the baby has a fear of being engulfed. If the, uh, if the mother is, uh, oh boy, yeah, it, he, it, it's hard reading. Uh, he, he talks about it in one of his books, the baby fear, the fears of the baby, the, the fears that the baby develops of the mother in response to the way the mother is handling the baby. He's a little graphic about that. But they, these fears can go away if the mother is good enough. If the good enough memories outweigh the frustrating memories, everything's fine. The mother just needs to be good enough. But if the negative memories outweigh the positive memories, then the baby has this frightening image of his mother. And the way to deal with the frightening image, the theory is the baby becomes the frightening image. He becomes the narcissist. Thus, identification processes were used more for defense, i.e. the child imitated the mother in total and in this way perfected a controllable kinesthetic image of the mother to replace the threatening representation of the mother. Maybe in colloquial expressions we might say, if you can't beat them, join them kind of thing. So maybe the child is thinking, I can't handle this monster mother. I'll just be like, I'll just be her. Maybe he's thinking in that way, but he's, so he's losing himself. That's a huge cost, right? I mean, he, he's, he's lost himself, right? He, so he doesn't know himself. He can't find the truth, and he can't express the truth. TQ413. Uh, he uh, he's just trying to survive. And he, that's why when, when people overly praise their mothers like that, that's a sign of a deep ambivalence. This over-evaluation, this grandiose, extreme high praise for the mother, that she's the greatest this and the greatest that, uh, that's a sign of the, of the splitting defense, of an insecure attachment style. Mothers are not goddesses or demons. They're just regular people caught in their existential dilemma. The mother may have had prenatal trauma when she was in her mother's womb. The mother may have had birth trauma when she was born, wherever she was, right? The mother may have had situational traumas in her environment. There may have been intergenerational trauma where the mother wasn't able to go through the separation individuation process. Uh, the mother had other experiences uh, that, and she had to adopt def defense mechanisms herself, and she's caught in her existential defense mechanisms. So then she has a baby, and she doesn't know how to do it. She doesn't know how to offer. She doesn't. She didn't have the. So there's that intergener. So, but we have to humanize our parents as being victims as well. Love your wounded neighbor with your wounded heart. Um, just try to see the person, appreciate the person as a whole person, good and bad at the same time, right? Something like that. This topic is tough, huh? This identification with the aggressor one. Because it's really, we're talking about trauma here, right? This only happens when the baby is being uh, mistreated. All right. What does the baby do? His psychic, he's overwhelmed. He, he, he just adopts because of that fusion. Remember the, from birth to six months, the baby and the mother are fused psychically. And if the mother's thoughts are impinging onto the baby, the baby, they become the baby's thoughts. The mother's thoughts become the baby's thoughts. Then he thinks those are his thoughts. That's called identification with the aggressor. And um, okay, four twelve was about coming out of the womb too early. I'll just leave that one. Um, nobody knows why do humans come out so so help so dependent, and uh, we can't even walk when we come out. Even the, even a chicken can hatch out and walk around, you know. <laughs> um, 
not a good example, but you know what I mean. We're, we're, we're dependent on our mothers. Uh, that's what I'm talking about. The human babies come out and we're highly dependent on our mother. We're not ready for the outer world. We're not ready. We, we depend on our mothers for the secure attachment style. So the mother plays such a crucial role. She really has a very important role uh, from birth to six months to, during the stage of symbiosis. And then following that is the stage of differentiation where the mother accepts that they're two different people. So there's a separation already that's beginning. The mother's got to accept that. Um, the mother's not, the mother can't think that the baby's her property and her supposed to do whatever she wants. Like she can't have those kinds of thoughts. It's not a thing. It's a human being. The baby's a human being, you know. It's, so uh, the baby's going to learn and explore and mother welcomes that uh, and then at the age of three I think the hippocampus comes online around at that time as well then the child can feel connected to himself and he's not and he doesn't have developmental trauma if he doesn't have developmental trauma then he's not caught in the repetition compulsion of the developmental trauma with the broken record replaying it all the time okay and uh, lastly 413 in general, know yourself, find the truth, express the truth. Again, know yourself, find the truth, express the truth. Okay, so thank you very much. This has been TQ 410 to 413. More to follow. Thank you. Bye for now.